morning, good morning. So good to see everybody. Let us uh, thank God for the gift of learning Torah together. I'm the Baruch Atad Noi Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bochar Bono Mikoh Amin V'Natan Lanu Et Torato, Baruch Atad Noi Noten HaTorah. So we're living in uh, even more historical times and even more unprecedented times. Uh, and since our last meeting, which was a week ago today, Tuesday, of course, we had the events of Wednesday. So, and in many ways, the events of Wednesday um, uh, reinforce and bring out a lot of the dramatic points that Isabel Wilkerson um, wrote about in CAST, culminating in the sections on lynching lynching as a means of terrorism to enforce the bottom social caste. And as you all know, a number of the people who came last Wednesday at the president's instigation brought Confederate flags and some of them brought a noose in the year 2021. So what I wanted to do was um, just, first of all, it, it, I had the experience of uh, when I was reading this at various points saying, oh my God, I just can't believe this. Or if, if those of you uh, who might have heard a lecture of Daniel Hartman on Sunday, Daniel Hartman reflected that when he was watching the events of the mass of the sacking of the Capitol, the insurrection, he kept saying, unbelievable, unbelievable. And there were a number of points when I read this book that I thought to myself, oh my God, this is unbelievable. So what I wanted to do first was just elicit some general reactions to the, basically we read from pages, you know, 50 to 100, rough and tough. Um, and uh, I wanted to invite some general reactions to those pages. And then I wanted to invite specifically the parts that caused you to say, oh my God, this is unbelievable. I didn't know that. I can't believe it. It's unbelievable. Did you, did anybody have moments like that from the first, uh, you know, from the, from these, from these chapters, pages 50 to hundred? Anybody? Linda Leffert. Uh, Linda, please unmute. I can't say and was totally surprised by the information, but I have some serious thoughts about the comparisons of, of um, and what was the same with the um, Holocaust versus what happened here. And what I didn't really realize as much until we read the other information is that in the case of the blacks, it started with slavery. What's first of all, what and what to start with, what struck me the most that I had never thought of, which is that what was this most the same about the Nazis and the United States of America is that they decided a certain class of people were inferior and would pollute their country. And when it became, what most struck me that I knew, but didn't think of it comparing it to the Nazis, was you could say, well, maybe you'd understand what happened. I mean, slavery started, it was economic. You know, they were working in the field like beasts of the field, et cetera, et cetera. But what was the justification for the miscegenation laws? Why was it illegal for blacks to marry whites? And at that point, it seems to me, they were exactly the example or the same as the Nazis, because the point was these people are inferior, they will pollute our society and we have to get rid of them. Right, and would, yeah, yeah. how many of you, yeah, how many of you knew, I didn't know this until I read this book, that when the Nazis in 1934 were looking for inspiration for how to make the Jews a permanent lower caste. This is before Wansi and before the final solution. This is during the you know, demonization, marginalization and anti you know, 
and they're not human legislation, that their example was the United States of America. Did you know that? John and Dixie, did you know that? And can you unmute? Uh, we, we both knew that, uh, having read other sources over time. Uh, and it, it was a wonderful justification for them. If America can do it, how could anyone, and they're a democracy, how can anyone call us anti-democratic? Right, right. And not only that America was able to keep blacks in their place, but America had a rosy reputation, so innocent. And that the Nazi, Nazis were copying us. Boy. Now, can I just can I just add? So, I mean, John and Dixie, you knew this. I did not know this. So I'm embarrassed to say. Um, I wanted to just ask if we could just pause here. How does that make you feel about our country? That our country's Horrible. history was literally Horrible. the inspiration for the Nazi legislation against the Jews. What does that do to you? How do you how do you feel about that? How do you begin to process that? Would anyone care to share? Anyone? Um, now Linda, I'll take you again. I would just say, don't feel so high and mighty. We can't feel so high and mighty like we're better than them. That's, right. a, you know, that was a, a, a big thing. And I did not know it to that extent. I had read, I knew about it a little, but not as in the kind of detail that Isabel Wilkerson describes and how documented it is actually. Right. And in fact, the coda, she's such an artful writer. I mean, such a gifted writer. The coda that actually the Nazis were not as bad as American legislation on blacks, right? Because American legislation on blacks had like, if there's one drop of black blood, they can't marry. And that was too much for the Nazis. That was how she ended that chapter. Um, that was just a shocker. Now, then the other thing I want to talk about at the end, and, and, and I'm sorry I brought you the pictures of lynchings, but I didn't feel that we could do justice to her book without talking about the lynchings. And, and they, they literally come from the pages of that last chapter. But what did you think of the comparison where the, the first part of that chapter about silence is evil is Germans who live near the camps that have, uh, you know, Cream, you know, they have cremated remains all over their house and, all, and the dust and the ashes of incinerated human beings are people and they just ignore it, don't focus on it. And then she shows you these, you know, word pictures and I sent you the actual pictures of, of white Americans near the lynchings, at the lynchings, um, just observing casually. Um, I'll, I'll want to talk about that in more detail, but the, the comparison of Nazis who knew and did nothing and Americans who knew and did nothing um, and the acquiescence of both is culpable. What did you think of that equation as well? Would love your thoughts on that. Anyone? Uh, Connie. Uh, well, it seems to be um, a human failing that when there's something gruesome going around, going in the, the, when there's something gruesome happening uh, and it's uh, okay, it's been okay by the establishment that people are afraid to speak up. Right, everyone put your foot, put your head down and go about your day. Now I understand that Connie, like especially with Hitler's Germany, you put your head down and you don't object. You don't want to be the next one thrown into camps. But I, I want to, and forgive me, again, I know this is more graphic than anyone is comfortable with ever, and especially on a Tuesday morning in Sisterhood Bible study. But if you take a look at the, at the hanging of Reuben Stacy, I want to just draw out one detail that she draws out. And I want to ask you, so if, if I can ask you to look at that, photograph of Reuben Stacy's hanging. 
she she dwells on two things and i want to add because i understand putting your head down and i don't want to make you know adolf hitler mad and i just want to be anonymous but i don't think that's what's going on here and that's not what's going on here and i want to ask you about the straw hat of the guy who's looking at a lynched black man who's kind of foppish kind of stylish like this kind of looks like the hat you would wear if it was a June Sunday and you're going to a, a fish bake or a lobster bake at the Cape. You know, you're gonna have a nice Sunday afternoon on some expanse of green lawn outside the ocean with a barbecue. You know, that's kind of white pants and a white you know, shirt and a nice Panamanian straw hat and it's summer and it's June and it's lobster and it's life is good. And he's wearing this straw hat to observe a lynching. That's not keeping your head down so that Hitler won't make you the next victim. What is that? And what, what, what is that? What is that? That straw hat, what is that? It's a party. Uh, uh, so I just wanted to say that um, What's the straw hat? And then what is the young girl in front of him? I mean, right. who brought her? And it had to have been him because you look at the people around and, and it's natural. I mean, it's, it's of course incredible that he is taking this as a, you know, a, a comment, a, something that he's seen before or heard about before and he just he's accept right. it's acceptance also it's um well he just wants to see what this is all about frightening frightening right and and her look so and this is a child who doesn't have childlike innocence or childlike horror this is childlike evil yeah she's kind of um enamored of entranced by mm. this hanging um so uh marilyn kalis it, it, it's entertainment yeah in, like a, red in a way and, and and i think it's it's uh it's a more uh a group uh, a group event almost you know that i'm just gonna uh, make the analogy to last Wednesday, where some people went just to, to view, to see what was going to happen, but then got caught up in it. Mm. Connie? It's a, it's a celebration to me. It looks like they're celebrating this event. Yes. Yeah. No, note the clothing. It's almost, it, it's kind of synagogue clothing. It's church clothing. It's Sunday morning, right? They're not wearing sweats and t-shirt and workout outfit. They're dressed up for a lynching. And, and last Wednesday's event had the same feeling. For the, I thought those people looked as though they were celebrating the, the breach. Right. They're dressed up for lynching. Right. So what I want to, and I want to ask you, how does this picture of the hanging of Reuben Stacy with a man in straw hat and presumably his daughter just looking on amused and bemused and entranced and everyone dressed in their Sunday best. How does that interpret the insurrection last Wednesday? And how does the insurrection last Wednesday interpret this photograph? What do these two moments in history say about one another? John, John Boris. I, I think they are similar in some ways, but also very different. Uh, what that photograph of the hanging shows me is that this is normal. Kids can come. It's not unexpected. It's it's part of the culture. It's uh, I I know that these lynchings were advertised in advance, so people could come. Uh, took the postcard, you know, pictures, 
sold them as postcards. That was normal. What happened uh, on Wednesday was not normal and is not accepted by our culture uh, as we are now seeing. Uh, it was a breach of our culture. I think the lynchings in the South were part of their culture. So I think there was a, a big difference. Okay. Um, I hear that, but what about the fact, John, that the energy, the negative energy, the evil energy, the hateful energy that made that photograph possible is still alive and kicking today. And in fact, mm -hmm. seems to be strong. Mm -hmm. I mean, she begins her whole story with the anthrax virus, mm -hmm. that this virus was supposedly, you know, was supposedly dead or whatever that virus was. I'm not a scientist, but the virus that was in Siberia that was buried in dead animals that the virus had filled. And then when it got hot enough and the land defrosted and the conditions were hot and ripe and ripe, that virus comes out. And what does the fact that, that yes, today, you know, most Americans would, would renounce this lynching as most Americans renounce um, Wednesday, although, although let's not be too optimistic about that. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Republicans in the Congress, in mm -hmm. the House of Representatives did not uh, vote um, to, in, you know, certify the election, and they're not going to vote to, for the 25th Amendment, and they're not going to vote for the impeachment of the president who instigated this. Um, and a lot of their constituents are the people who marched and held Confederate flags. So it's a breach and it's not normalized, but the energy that made it possible is still in our country. John. Wes? I, I, I believe that virus is there all the time. The question is, is it sanctioned to come out? And I think the current about to depart administration has made it okay to talk about it, has fanned it over five years now. And, uh, and my hope is it will be suppressed going forward. I don't think it it's at a flame level where it can do anything in our country uh, going forward. I, I, do, I do think a second administration of, of Trump would have been disastrous because there would have been enough changes in the way the laws are written to have made uh, pro real protest uh, difficult. Uh, so I, it's always there. It's in human beings. We have an evil part every one of us, uh, but how and when it comes out and whether it's sanctioned, whether it becomes part of the culture, uh, that's different. And clearly under slavery, that was accepted part of the culture uh, in a large part of the country, including parts of the North. Uh, but I think this is different. One person's opinion. Okay, other, other comments on on the on the relationship between this photograph and last Wednesday, uh, Peter Needle. You guys, Annette, you're still muted, my friend. Uh, Peter, you're still muted. Now you're not. Uh, Peter Meyerson. I think one has to, that we're looking at those straw hats through our own hats. And we have to ask the question about the role of the uh, Southern aristocracy in promoting this, who were people who went, I'm sure, to very fine schools. Today, the, it's the Certainly the Southern corporate elites who benefited by Trump's uh, tax policies and view of uh, class. And I think that we have to examine the role of those elites in encouraging the people who were there 
Uh, after all, they really didn't benefit by the Trump tax cuts and a whole variety of its other policies that helped corporations. And what is their role in helping to create the people who were there? And how can this be uh, changed, stopped, modified? What do you do to change? to change people's minds going forward. And I think the same question has to be asked about those who viewed the lynching. Uh, I don't know, what is, what is the upper strata doing to uh, help shape the values of others? Well, Peter, let me ask you a question based on what you just said. And I wanna introduce a religious value it's actually the single most important religious value that Judaism teaches us. It's number one and, and clearly the most important, which is that every human being is made with Selim Elohim in the image of God. And therefore every human being is entitled to infinite dignity. Now, here's my question. Looking at this photograph, all of us on this call see the tragedy that of a black man whose dignity and who's being created in God's image was not recognized in his society. And, and, and what shame on our country and what shame on our history. And that, that summons forth the question, what do we do about it now? Which is, we'll, we'll get to that. But I have in a way a tougher question. And it's, it's a real question, it's not a rhetorical question. Do you, I mean, the Torah teaches that all human beings are made in God's image. This man with the straw hat who dressed up for a lynching and, and got his daughter in her finest cotton starch dress for a lynching, and they came to enjoy a nice lynching. What, how does that intersect with Selim Elohim, with the image of God? And do you like, and to me, this is, Steve Gelda asked a version of that question on Sunday to Daniel Hartman. So Daniel Hartman made the point in his lecture that difference does not undermine a community. It's how you navigate that difference, how you navigate that difference that undermines a community. And therefore, one of the things that Daniel called on us to do is to navigate our differences better, more compassionately, et cetera. And Steve Gelda asked the question, basically, I can understand that that's doable with the person at Kiddush, at Temple Emanuel, who has different politics than me. And, and, I, and I, you know, I, would, I would try to have that conversation with somebody who had different politics and okay, that's fair enough. But how do you, ha how do, you do that with the people who are wearing t-shirts that say Camp Auschwitz? staff counselor or the people who were wearing t-shirts to say 6 million was not enough. And, and I guess my, and the, I guess my question is, what do you do with that part of the energy that's truly loathsome? Um, like you have to be pretty loathsome to put on a straw hat and take your daughter to a lynching. And, and how does, and what happens to religious values of infinite dignity and God's image? when we encounter evil like this? That's my question, a real question. I'd love people's thoughts. Wes, can I say something, Wes? Yes, who is that? Esther. It's Esther. Ah, Esther, okay, Esther, sure, please. Okay, I'm coming from a different point of view. I agree with you totally, to be honest. But what I'm trying to say, I came to this country in the 80s, in the first time in my life, I saw swastikas on a, on a trolley. My mother was shocked. And then the, the, the president, the, the Charles, Charles Ray, he said, there are, there are good people in both ways. How didn't we see what's going to come? We are, we are so in, embedded in this history of hatred in this country. How, I, I don't understand that. And then I saw a YouTube from 
Schwarzenegger. It it amazes me that people do not open their eyes and seeing that it was in, incomprehensible, but it it happened, and and it bothers me. I'm sorry, Esther. I will I will double down on your conundrum. I'll double down on it. Not only do I share it, but let's just take it a level deeper. I mean, um, he said that there's fine people on both sides, that the Nazis are fine. Correct. Um, and it's obvious that that Kristallnacht was not just metaphorically true, but literally true, that it was broken glass. They broke glass on Wednesday. <laughs> But when I made this point in Veterans Day, I got so much grief from the Jewish community. And there are, there are Jews, and including on this call, who support, I don't know if they still support the president, but they supported the president. And so here's a question. How could you be a Jew and hear that there's fine people on both sides, including Nazis? Nazis are fine people. And, and you still support... So it's very challenging. I don't have the answer to that. All I know is I, I, I've not been uh, particularly effective at dealing with it because I've pissed off a lot of Trump supporters at Temple Emanuel. Many t Trump supporters have left the synagogue. Those who have not left the synagogue, uh, I am damaged goods to them. Um, when, I, when I wrote that email about Watch out, this is Crystal Knopf. This is getting very, very serious. What he's doing is breaking norms. No president has ever done this. I got I spent the rest of the month having angry calls with members of Temple Emanuel, who I, I reached out to every one of them who sent me a flaming email. And I don't I so Esther, I don't understand it. I'm not particularly good at dealing with it. I don't understand it, but um what can I say? So here's here's a question that I have for you. Um, and it's kind of, in a way, it's the same question. You read about the chapter, uh, the end of, of, of our reading, where she quotes Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who says, not to act is to act, and not to speak <clears throat> is to speak. And that chapter is called The Evil of Silence. Uh, the evil of all those people who are looking at a lynching, the evil of the Nazis who were Hitler's willing executioners, who surely knew that fellow human beings were being burnt to death because the ashes of those human beings were on their windshield wipers, and they did nothing. So here's my question. What does this book summon you to do? And... What does last Wednesday summon you to do? Um, Linda Leffert. I think that I had done more this past year than in the past to support Democratic <laughs> candidates do this group called the Force Multiplier. Right. And um, because to me, I get inundated with mail and it's hard to sort it out. And they do, uh, you know, assuming that you want, you know, you have a point of view that you'd like to help. They have people who do the work to basically try to figure out who has a chance to win. And do try to support women where they're available, but it's whoever is the best candidate. For example, they weren't in favor of de develop, you know, necessarily if your funds are limited, which most are, how, no matter how much you have to vote for, uh, ditched Mitch McConnell. Because he wasn't going to get ditched. You know, there was no way. So spend your money and spend your time. For example, the first time I contributed money twice, I mean, $100 each time, it's not a fortune. Uh, to support those Democratic candidates in the Georgia senatorial election. So what one move, Linda, they, is one move is political engagement. You know, and political politics that is consistent with your convictions. Okay, that's a, that, the second yeah. is to do what you can, even though it's hard, 
to try to talk to people close to you that you have a chance that they might listen. I mean, I have two close relatives, one of whom we stay close by having agreed years ago not to discuss politics. And I have another one very well educated and we have different views and we can talk about it. So I haven't thought of it. Have you talked to them? Have you talked to them since Wednesday, Linda? Uh, no, I have not. But um, um, uh, it will be interesting. I will talk to the one. I talk to him regularly. I talk to him about once a week. We have a FaceTime call. He lives in D outside DC. Right. Um, what, one, of the, one of the people who was very aggressive in response to my Veterans Day email reached out to me after Wednesday. And I said, I emailed this person and I said, what, what did you think of Wednesday, including the t-shirts, um, and this is a Jewish individual, you know, six million was not enough, and Camp Auschwitz work makes freedom. And he said, oh, that was, those were not Trump supporters, though, that was Antifa. Um, just so it's, it's a whole, you know, in other words, the there's no bottom on the capacity to spin conspiratorial tales. Um, that the people who did this violence were Antifa, they were not Trump supporters. Uh, and so I, I don't, I honestly, I don't know what one does with that. I just don't know what one, one does with that. With, when, when there's no truth and there's no facts and all this conspiracy, conspiratorial thinking, I don't know what, the, what one does with that. But the interesting thing is why a Jewish individual would think that way and would go down the rabbit hole of conspiracy thinking. I just don't quite get what's going on with that. But anyway, my question back to the group, and Annette Miller, your hand was up, is what does this moment summon us to do? And what does this book, uh, the, the Evil of Silence, summon us to do? Annette Miller, your hand was up. Oh, uh, I don't know what it summons us to do if I have the answer to that. But I think that it's going to be painful for you, Rabbi, to speak your mind, and you're going to hear many people that disagree, and people will leave your temple for that reason, and you and we will have to live with that, so that we can't be afraid of the pain that it's going to cost us. All we can really do is support more of the values that we believe in. I mean, I will say for the first time, I have not in the past contributed to some um, election in another state, I, I really hadn't done that to that degree that I had now, and I and I did, and I sent out postcards, and I think that the grassroots movement was very strong. I think that's what Dot Ossoff and Warnick um, elected. They had more money, um, and we had a better grassroots um, uh, operation, and it it wasn't fantastic. It was a very close margin. Uh, I think we all we can do is to continue to educate. I, I don't think you're going to convince. I mean, I had conversation as well with someone that just felt how any Jew could think about Black Lives Matter. And I just couldn't go into the entire um, right. uh, program again. So I, I just think that we just have to continue to do what we're doing and be more active. It's incumbent upon what we must do right now. That's my only answer, quite frankly. Uh, anyone else want to talk about um, responses to the last chapter and responses to the book uh, and to this moment? And then I have a gentler topic uh, that also flows from her chapter. Um, I can tell you what, what we're going to do here at the temple, uh, to, uh, which is Back in the days when we used to go to shul in person, on the last Yom Kippur when we did that, our speaker before Ne'ila was a guy named Jeremy Battle, who is the Black Baptist preacher of a Black Baptist church, the Western Avenue Baptist Church in Cambridge. And he had a really nice connection with all of the clergy here at the shul. And what we're going to do is re is is come up with a program to read cast together his church and our synagogue, so that we can actually be in dialogue. I mean, if in a non-COVID world we'd be able to be at each other's, you know, 
communities and we'd go to their church and they'd come to the synagogue and we'd be together physically. Obviously, we can't do that in COVID times. But what we are going to do is create some, um, some spaces where both of our communities can connect on this book. And in an ideal world, again, as I said last week, I would love to, um, I would just love to be able to go to the museum with, with his community. So, so stay tuned for that. Okay, now I have a gentler question from this book, but it was, uh, it was also a kind of an amazing story to me. And I'm wondering, this is a much gentler kind of, of racism or a gentler kind of, uh, uh, oh, I, I, I subconscious bias or unconscious bias, um, which, um, which, which we, was in, in our reading today. Namely, she tells the story when she was a writer for the New York Times of uh, making a date to meet with an executive in the retail industry. And she does not name this gentleman or person, I don't know if it's a man or a woman. Uh, and, and they make a designated time and designated place and she's there ready to interview this executive. And this executive comes in and doesn't see her, sees right past her and says, I can't meet with you. I have an important meeting with somebody from the New York Times. And she says, I I'm your interview. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the person who's interviewing. No, 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 no. I'm, me I'm, interviewing with, I'm meeting with somebody from the New York Times. And that's me. I'm from the New York Times. No, no, no. And he doesn't see her. And he insists on her card. And she has actually run out of New York Times cards at that moment. So she didn't have her business card. And in the end, he wouldn't see her because he could not imagine that a Black woman was a reporter for the New York Times. And my question is, do we do that? Nobody, nobody does or ever would do the terrible photographs that I sent you that flow from her last chapter. But do we do that? Do we have unconscious bias like that retail executive who could not imagine that a Black woman was the reporter from the New York Times. And, and how do we, how, if we do, uh, how do we handle that? Uh, any thoughts on that? Yes. Yes, who's that? Esther. Esther, okay. I agree with her a million percent. If we are not going to stick to one another as a human race, it's going to perpetuate over and over and over again. That's why we are learning in the Torah. You cannot, you cannot disregard another human being. It doesn't matter who he is and what he is. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I, this is to say that um, I, I found that while the stuff about the crematoria ashes on cars and lynchings was so chilling and the commonality between the American experience putting mm -hmm. blacks in their cast and the Nazi experience putting Jews in their cast was chilling, the part that was uh, chilling in a different way was just seeing past a black woman because how could a black woman be a reporter for the New York Times? And that, that question of unconscious bias um, is, uh, I think is another, is another response to the question, what can we do? What can we do? So, um, so here's what I wanted to, uh, to invite you. Any, any other comments on these, uh, on, on the first 96 pages that we have read? Um, and, uh, and I just, in general, I'd love if anyone wants to just continue to share their reactions to the book, are you finding it, uh, a helpful revelation? Are you finding it too disturbing? Are you finding it not as relevant as others? Anyone wants to share any ongoing yeah. reactions to the book? I, I would do. love to, to hear them. Wes? Yes. That's Dottie. Dottie would love to hear your comments. First of all, <clears throat> when 
the part about Martin Luther King and the cast, how they, he, how insulted he felt when they spoke about the uh, untouchables. They took him to a, all over India. He was there for a month in that part there. I think I expected to read a lot of these things because I read her last book, The Warmth of Other Suns. Yeah. And she, yeah. have you read it? Uh, no. It's excellent. It. So I'm, she it's takes good. the story of three, I can't remember too much, three black southerners and they come up north for a better life for freedom and what happens to them. And when she talks about that with that guy from the retail store, she says it's the root of it. it, it that when she says to, because the problem is the root and unless you get the root out, you're never gonna get rid of this evil. And I truly feel the Southerners with the Confederate flag, they, they never got over the Civil War. And I think this is one of the problems I spent time in a very fancy place with a few Southern people in Mississippi, they were Alabama, they were highly educated, prosperous. And the fact that at this particular place, there were many, there, were, there was a, a meeting of black judges and lawyers. They were so insulted. They turned to me and they said, what right have they got to be where, do they have to be where we are? I said, they're human beings. I said, they're no different. Why, the color of the skin? And they said to me, yes, they do not deserve to be with us. I never, I never, this must be 30 years ago. And I think that <clears throat> today they would think the same way you, it's, I don't, I think part of the problem is the South never got over the Civil War, the loss of the Civil War, and they cannot understand. And this caste system, she says it perfectly. She explains it and she, because if you think about what happened in this country, when the Irish came, how they treated them so poorly in the beginning of the 20th, 20th century, and the Chinese who were just laborers and digging in the mines or whatever, and can't, it has happened, but they cannot release that the black people can share our bounty. And that's what it is. But your speaker said, God gives you bounty and feel safe. I think it was Daniel Hartman and God, God helps those who help themselves, but I don't see how it's helping them. That's that's my main problem. Thank you, Dottie. Any other um, any other general reactions? I mean, one reaction to it, uh, Dottie. What I hear you saying is the Civil War never ended, and um, there's just different versions of the tensions that made the Civil War possible. And last Wednesday was another florid example of that. Uh, Dixie, Dixie, your, your hand is up. I think you're frozen. I'm talking now. Um, I have a general comment for almost all that you have said and what many of us have been re alluding to here now. First is we are all human beings for better or for worse. We all struggle daily, yearly, always. We all struggle to, to be alive. We're always making choices. We are always continuing to learn. And hopefully when we learn more, we are able to make choices which benefit us and humanity in general. For some of us, that's not possible. We cannot learn. We choose not to learn and we don't make choices for the benefit of humanity. Um, what I'm thinking is that to concentrate on the machinery of government, um, that actually refers to uh, our way of voting, perhaps working on gerrymandering, perhaps working on the way we are represented through the census there are actually very specific um, government apparatuses which we can change and which will be helpful to all of us. Um, 
the thought that I really had when you were talking about conversation and who we can talk with, this has been extremely troubling to me. And way back when the gentleman was first elected, I read a lot of books about how and why he could possibly have been elected. What were people possibly thinking? Now, all of these years later, I have read a lot. There are, I still don't know. I'm supposing that there are different people thought different things. My conclusion for myself is I am available. I will try to talk with anybody who might want to talk with me, but I'm not into changing anyone's mind currently. I'm into making sure the government works for the majority of us. Um, I would like to ask you then um, how it has affected you to be personally put on the spot over and over by people in our synagogue. Do you feel attacked? Do you feel um, made stronger? Um, what do you feel? Uh, thank you for the question, Dixie. I feel torn and tormented. I feel torn and tormented because, um, and, and you know, my colleagues and I talk every day, every week. You know, what what are we going to teach the Shabbos? And and there's two schools of thought. You know, overwhelmingly, all of us are inclined to talk about the issues of the day, the insurrection, etc., because that's that's a synagogue has to be relevant to people's lives otherwise it's irrelevant and what people are thinking about all the time however you take the news is what is happening to our country we have to speak to that question what is happening to our country and what can we do about it how can we be helpful what can what can each of us do to make it a little better but inevitably there will be a strong counter response from people who say, ah, you're talking about politics, make this place a sanctuary from politics. If we want politics, we can go on the news source of our choice. Uh, we can watch CNN or you know, Fox News or whatever we wish. We could read the journal or the Washington Post, whatever we wish. Uh, we don't need that. We don't come to synagogue for that. We come to synagogue for sanctuary, for peace, for Jewish values, for Torah. Talk to us about Moses and Pharaoh. Don't talk to us about Trump and Nancy Pelosi. If I want Trump and Nancy Pelosi, I know where to go. But the only place I can go for Moses and Pharaoh and God is here at the temple. And that feels to me like acquiring peace at the cost of irrelevance. So I'm not comfortable with that deal, peace at the cost of irrelevance. But what torments me and tears me is by being relevant, I turn people off and they're offended and it destroys a sense of sanctuary. And we, and I cannot, you know, and that's for, that's for people who give nothing and that's for people who give a lot of money. I mean, I, I've offended personally donors from the left who think I'm too far right. And I've offended donors from the right who think I'm too far left. And I've offended ordinary folks who don't give, but they've been members for years. I'm too far right, they leave because they're left, or I'm too far left, they leave because I'm right. And I, so it's, I would say torn and tormented. And even now, even now, you know, um, it's, uh, it's a conundrum. I mean, I, I, I in, in some ways, what I want to do, I, I, I don't think I could do it in the shul as a whole, but I, I want to show them that I would love everybody in the synagogue to read that chapter about evil is the evil of silence. 
I would like everybody in the ch in the synagogue to see the hanging of Reuben Stacy. I would like everybody in the synagogue to think about the fact that that the noose that hang that that, that lynched Reuben Stacy was brought to the nation's capital last week in 2021. And I would like everyone in the community to ask, what is my piece of this? What do I do about this? What do we do about this? What's my re moral responsibility? Do I, as a Jew, believe Diedrich Bonhoeffer that to say nothing is to say something and to do nothing is to do something? And what? And am I any different from the Germans who just cleared the, the ashes off their windshield wiper and got in their car and drove? I mean, a noose was brought and a Confederate flag was brought by American citizens less than a week ago. What, what do I do with that? And I, and I, and I want to bring that question, but I know inevitably that when I do, I will get 100 emails from angry people saying, do you know, Pete, when I sent out that Veterans Day email, people called me deranged. Our members called me deranged. Deran they called me deranged. I have Trump derangement syndrome. So. I don't, so that's the answer. I'm tormented and I'm torn. And, and part of me also would love to be able to keep this community together as a place of love and sanctuary. But between the pandemic and the pandemic of politics, that's just getting really hard to do. So work in progress. So guys, um, let me just end my class with two Haftarah up notes. Um, I, I also feel like this has been some of the worst teaching I've ever done because I, I remember when Jonathan Sachs died, one of the members of our shul, Paul Greenberg, who sometimes is on this class, he had reached out to Jonathan Sachs and said, um, I saw a TED talk about the problems of the world and and you were, he writes us in an email and you were so uh, thoughtful and quiet and modest and upbeat and hopeful about the problems of the world. And don't the problems of the world demand a more angry, high volume tone. And Jonathan Sachs writes him back. Some guy doesn't even know, never met. And he says, uh, uh, and he quotes the story from 1 Kings 19 about Elijah in the cave and that God is not in the fire and God is not in the earthquake and not, God is not in the, in, in the tempest. God is in cold mama daka, the still small voice. And then Jonathan Sachs writes and says, the best leadership is offered quietly, still small voice and with moderation and with hope and with optimism. And, and I feel like I fail that every time, including this class. So, but I wanted to give you two, um, I wanted to give you two um, things that are hopeful. One is tomorrow at 1.30, Micha Goodman from Israel is talking about the theology of Jonathan Sachs. And that feels like a very hopeful move. So that's tomorrow at 1.30. I sent uh, an email about that, Micha Goodman on Jonathan Sachs. And then on Sunday at 10 a.m., Micha is going to be talking about his new book that came out in English, The Wandering Jew. Not The Wandering Jew with an A, but The Wandering Jew. And it's about the problems of religion um, and also the redemption of religion. So, so we have two spots to hear Micha and that is just always hopeful and beautiful. Tomorrow at 1.30 and Sunday at 10 o'clock. So for next week, if I can, she's next week, um, she's gonna talk about the, the different pillars of, um, of cast. So if you could read uh, about the first, read 50 pages. We're gonna try to do this in about 50 pages a week. Uh, so read 50 pages and we will get together again next Tuesday. Lots of love, guys, and thank you very much. Thank Bye. you.